In this program, you'll learn how to make and keep your lawn beautiful. The first step, then, is to evaluate its condition. If you need to plant new grass, segment two will show you how to pick the best seed for a healthy and low maintenance lawn. Then, I'll demonstrate how to prepare the lawn or seed bed for seeding or sodding with guaranteed great results. Direct seeding doesn't have to be complicated. Segment four has tips and step-by-step -step instructions for seeding a lawn. If you want to see new grass quickly, sodding rather than seeding may be for you. I'll show you the proper technique in segment five. Mowing is critical to any lawn. We'll look at the two most important factors, how often to mow and at what height the grass should be cut. Do you water your lawn every day in the summer? That may be too much. I'll have tips on how and when to water. Too much fertilizer can hurt your lawn. I'll show you a good diet for your grass so you only need to feed it once or twice a year. And finally, you can prevent many pest and disease problems in your lawn through proper care. In this segment, I'll give you the latest techniques. In this program, I'm going to show you how to have an attractive lawn that requires less water, less fertilizer, less frequent mowing, and less need for pesticides. There's considerable research that shows that the average American lawn tends to be overwatered, fertilized too often and improperly, mowed too often and too closely, leaving the grass prone to attack from insects, disease, and weeds, necessitating heavy use of pesticides. Now I'm gonna try to show you how you can have a successful low maintenance lawn that uses certain cultural practices that are designed to optimize the growth of the grass while minimizing the opportunity for insects, disease, and weeds to become established and thrive. Lawn care may be one of those things in life where more is not necessarily better. So let's get to it. Most lawn problems are usually caused either by a soil deficiency or bad lawn care practices or because the grass is an older, inferior variety that's susceptible to insects and pests, or all of the above. For example, using a highly soluble fertilizer on poor soil just asks for problems. It does the job at the cost of a deeply penetrating root system. Consequently, the lawn becomes vulnerable later in the season to drought. It's real green in the spring, but later disaster. Now, modern intensive lawn care practices, including intensive fertilizing, heavy watering, and frequent use of pesticides, initially can lead to gratifying results. However, over time, about three to five years, those same intensive lawn care practices can lead to some very serious lawn and soil problems. Now, how do we know if our lawn has any problems? Well, there are a number of good tests to take to evaluate your lawn. First, there are the visual tests on top of the soil. Take a look at the color of your grass. A nice, moderate green color is what you're looking for. Faded color with brown and green blades means problems. And a deep, rich green may look nice, but it could indicate an overfed turf. Next, check the thickness or the density of your grass. The turf should be thick enough so that you can't see the soil at all. If you can see the soil, there's room for weeds and you need to take some action. Look at the height of your grass. Except for a very few new varieties, the height of the grass should be from one and a half to two inches high after it is cut. Some varieties like a height of between two and three inches. If you don't know which variety you have, cutting your lawn below an inch and a half can mean problems. What about your grass clippings? Do they disappear quickly? If you can see rows or piles of clippings after mowing, you may not be mowing frequently enough. What about water runoff? Does the water sit on top of the turf after a heavy rain? If it does, you probably have drainage problems. Can you see any brown spots? 
Either circles or rings of brown will indicate possible disease problems. Check the percentage of weeds in your lawn. A good lawn contains no weeds at all, although 10 to 20% is often not unsightly. A lawn with up to 50% weeds can still be renovated, but over 50% and you need to start from scratch and rebuild that lawn. Next, we want to check the layer of thatch in our lawn. A stiff grass rake is good for that job. Thatch is that organic material made up of old grass clippings, roots, and stolons that sit on the surface of the soil. Generally, thatch is beneficial to a lawn if it's not any thicker than a half an inch. About a quarter of an inch to a half an inch represents a healthy layer of thatch. Serving as a natural mulch, thatch insulates the soil and reduces water evaporation. It also reduces soil compaction and it increases the springiness of the turf grass as well as increasing the turf grass's wear tolerance. Finally, it decomposes biologically, returning valuable nutrients to the soil. A layer of thatch in excess of three quarters of an inch, which I think is what it took to make this pile, is usually caused by over fertilizing or watering too much. Now an excessive layer of thatch prevents air and moisture from getting down to the roots of the grass, causing the turf to dry out much too rapidly and it serves as a haven for disease and insects. Now it's estimated that almost half of the lawns that are under intensive chemical fertilizing programs now have thatch or are going to develop thatch in the next three to five years. Now if you have too much thatch, you have to remove it mechanically. Next, we can check the conditions underneath the surface of the soil. After a good rain, we're gonna take a sharp knife and cut a triangle of turf about three to four inches deep. Remember, we don't want to use the best kitchen knife we have. This is going to make the knife real dull very quickly. Then we take a trowel and dig out our triangle, like so. We're looking for two things here. We want to check the color of the soil, because the darker the soil, the more humus content we have. And then we want to check the depth of our root system. If it's four to six inches, it's OK. If it's less than four inches, then we have a shallow root system and that can lead to problems. Compaction is checked by taking a screwdriver and sticking it down into the soil. If it's heavy resistance, that means you probably have a compaction problem. It should go in moderate to easy, like that. How about earthworms in your soil? A shovel full of turf and soil should include at least three to five earthworms to indicate a balanced, healthy ecosystem in your yard. And finally, you can get more detailed technical information about your lawn if you take a soil test. That'll tell you about your soil's fertility and its pH level. You can get a soil test kit like this for about four or five dollars from your local county extension office. They're usually listed in the phone book under county government. The kits will come with a full set of instructions. It only takes about 15 minutes to take a sample. The first step is to take soil samples from several different areas in the yard. Most lawn grasses require nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in a ratio of three to one to two. But the results of a soil test will tell you exactly what ratio to use on your lawn and whether you need to raise or lower your soil's pH. It takes about two or three weeks to get your soil test report back. If it tells you you have some problems, or with your other inspections you learned you had too much thatch or too many weeds, it's time to take some action. Let's talk about grass seed. The first consideration is, what kind of grass seed do you now have in your lawn? because seed selection is the first step in having a low-maintenance lawn. And the two most important questions to ask in the seed selection process are, what grasses are best adapted for your particular area? And how long ago did somebody plant your lawn? Now this may sound extreme, 
But if the existing variety of grass in your lawn is over 10 years old, I suggest that you completely overseed it so that in a few years, those existing varieties are entirely replaced by new varieties. There have been tremendous advances in the quality of lawn seed in the last 10 years. And the new generation of grasses have been bred for absolutely low maintenance care. And that's what we're all looking for. Now you need to find grass seed that works in your area because varieties of grass vary widely in their cool hardiness, in their water requirements, in their disease resistance, and in their soil preference. Those that grow best where summers are cool are called cool season grasses and are primarily from the bluegrass, perennial rye, and fescue families. In hot summer areas, these perennials often behave as annuals. Consequently, where summers are long and hot, heat-loving Bermuda, St. Augustine, and other warm season grasses are the preferred choices. Almost one-third of the country lies in what grass professionals call the transitional zone a mini climate where both cool season and warm season grasses are often grown as blends. However, the best lawns in this area are either all Bermuda grass or all turf type tall fescue. While local conditions in those three areas will vary in precipitation, temperature extremes, and soil conditions, let me quickly review your general options. For cool season grasses in the north, we've all heard of Kentucky bluegrass. Part of the beauty of bluegrass lawns is that they perform best when mowed high at about one and a half to two inches. Now, Kentucky bluegrass will not grow just anywhere. It does not tolerate drought very well, and it may fail miserably on thin, poor soils. When new bluegrass lawns are started from seed, the bluegrass is often mixed with a perennial ryegrass, which germinates faster than the bluegrass and acts as a nurse crop while the bluegrass is getting started, and then later becomes part of the permanent lawn mixture. Also valuable are the fine fescues, which have low fertilizer requirements, and they're really the best cool season grass to plant in the shade. Fescues will grow anywhere except in low, wet places. A fine fescue mixed with some bluegrass and some perennial rye may be the answer to northerners looking for a simple, low-maintenance lawn with good disease resistance and adapted to both full sun and partial shade. For grasses in the south, studies have revealed that two warm season grasses, Bermuda and Buffalo, require 20% less water than their cool season counterparts, bluegrass and fescue. That's why they're able to look good through the scorching weather. It's because of their superior efficiency in getting and keeping water. Now the most widely used warm season grasses are improved or hybrid forms of Bermuda grass, which make a strong and dense turf that tolerates heavy abuse. They're beautiful in the hottest weather. These grasses can be propagated though only by planting sprigs or using sod and they do turn brown come fall and stay that way until spring. The solution to that problem is to overseed with a fine fescue or a perennial ryegrass, giving you good green color all year long. St. Augustine grass is not as cold hardy, but it needs less feeding and mowing and stands more shade. Then within those broad categories, the variety of grass seed can also be affected by other factors. Is your lawn going to be in partial shade or is it going to be exposed to the full sun? If it's in partial shade, you're probably going to want a mix that has a lot of fescue in it. Fescue does well in the shade. How much time are you willing to spend maintaining your lawn? Different varieties of grass take differing amounts of attention. Finally, is your lawn just for decoration or are you going to use it for recreation? Some varieties by themselves make very nice lawns, but they can't take much wear. If you've got teenagers playing volleyball every day, you need a mixture of varieties that's gonna be able to handle that beating. So with all this, when you walk into the garden center and you're confronted with your barrels of different varieties of grass from which you have to make up a mixture, how do you choose? I suggest that if you're a beginning lawn gardener, you don't even try. I believe that you should buy a high quality mixture of varieties already prepared to work well in your particular neighborhood. I also believe that grass seed happens to be one of those products where it's important to buy the very highest quality even though it costs more money. 
Bargain grass seed will cost money in the long run with the problems it can cause in the future. Now a properly prepared seeding operation is going to give you a lawn that's going to last from 10 to 20 years. So a few dollars extra invested now will make a big difference in the life of your lawn. If after evaluating your lawn and you find you have more than a half an inch of thatch or more than 50% weeds or maybe too many bare spots in the backyard or if the roots on your turf are less than three inches long and you want to do something about those problems, you have two choices. You can either renovate and completely overseed the existing lawn, reseeding and resodding those bare spots, or you can start from scratch and build an entirely new lawn. Now I prefer the renovation approach. It's cheaper, it takes less time, and you can usually do it yourself. Now whether you renovate or build a brand new lawn, the principles are pretty much the same. So in this program, we'll just deal with the steps involved in renovating that old lawn. You can renovate either in the early spring when the grass begins to grow, or in the early fall when the soil begins to cool. The first renovation step is to scalp your lawn. That means to mow it very closely. You do that in the spring to remove the winter killed foliage, or in the fall to remove the summer injury problems caused by insects or drought. The second step is to remove the thatch. If your thatch is over a quarter inch thick, you can use a dethatching tool to pull out that layer of accumulated organic debris. Now you can rent such a tool, or you can use a home tiller with a special attachment like this to do the job. These tools will tear out the weeds and the thatch, but leave most of the good grass intact. And you can compost that debris. Now you want to go over the area six or seven times in different directions. Then we want to throw away this thatch material. Now I said that this wouldn't hurt the grass, but if your thatch is more than an inch thick, then there could be live roots right within the thatch layer, and there could be some harm to the turf. But you should do the job anyway, because we want to get rid of as much of this old vegetation as we can, and the turf will recover. Now if your lawn has a serious thatch problem, or it has more than 50% weeds, or has a lot of bare spots, the chances are good that that lawn is fighting a soil that's either infertile or poorly drained or both. So we have to do something to fix that soil under the turf. First, we'll aerate the soil. Aeration is particularly advised where the soil has become compacted. It's gonna reduce the thatch problems in the turf and at the same time, it cuts shallow grooves into the soil for overseeding and for creating space for roots to break through. Set your aerating machine to cut into the soil surface about a quarter of an inch deep. And it's important to make several passes at various angles across the lawn. Now if you turn up some more thatch in this process, just rake it up and throw it away. The next step is to apply fertilizer and lime if it's needed, using some kind of a spreader. You should apply this fertilizer at only one half the amount recommended either by a soil test or the fertilizer box. A good example of an easily spread organic fertilizer is this stuff called melorganite. Now if you want to use a commercial synthetic fertilizer, be sure to use only one that has a slow release form of nitrogen. Before we get to the reseeding process, let me show you how to prepare a bare spot where there's no grass worth saving. Whether you're going to reseed or resod this bare spot, or in fact if you're going to start a whole new lawn from scratch, the following steps are essential. First, you'll till or dig the soil and remove all the debris and stones. Then enough organic matter should be added to physically change the structure of your soil to a depth of about six to eight inches, the area where most grass roots will grow. So the final soil mixture should be at least 25% organic matter by volume, which is twice as much as is usually recommended for a vegetable or a flower garden. About two inches of organic matter mixed into that top six to eight inches is usually sufficient. This organic matter should be added to all but rich loam soils. 
peat moss, compost, leaf mold, or well-aged manure are all good amendments. Now lime can be added at the same time if your soil test shows an excess of acidity. If you have an alkaline problem, use sulfur or gypsum. And finally, we'll rake the surface smooth. And now we're ready for seeding or sodding. As I mentioned earlier, the best time to seed or sod in the north is the early spring or the early fall, and in the south, mid to late spring. Now, if we're going to overseed an existing lawn, we'll use just half the amount of grass seed that would normally be required for a brand new lawn or for a bare spot. And if you have any kind of area at all, it's almost essential to use some kind of spreader to make sure you get an even distribution of that seed. Then when we finish spreading the seed, we're gonna give the entire lawn a very thorough watering, up to an inch of water so we get water down at least six inches into the soil. Then when we got the watering job done, we're gonna roll it. Now the rolling does two things. It flattens out the surface, but even more important, it makes very sure there's good contact between the seed and the soil. Usually when you're overseeding an existing lawn, you don't have to worry about any mulch over that new seed. The existing turf will protect those seeds from being washed away. Now when you're gonna seed a bare spot or a brand new lawn, the process is a little bit different. This project takes a few more steps. When you're seeding a bare spot or a brand new lawn, you're gonna use seed according to the instructions on the box. For something this size, we can spread our seed by hand. The only thing we wanna be sure of is that we try to spread the seed fairly evenly. Okay, now I'm going to lightly rake the entire surface, but only down to a quarter of an inch. So I'm gonna use the back of the rake. Now we wanna roll the surface of this area to make sure we get absolutely maximum contact between the seed and the soil. Now, to protect this seed from being washed away by a heavy rain, we want to lay out a very light mulch of straw. Not enough to cover up the soil so the grass can't grow, just enough to protect the grass from that rain. So we're gonna cover the whole area lightly. After putting down the mulch, we want to give this area a thorough watering. But here we want to be sure that we use a nozzle that has a soft spray. We don't want to wash that mulch right away. Just as with the overseeding, we want to give this area at least an inch of water so that the soil is moistened down about six inches. Then we get to the important step. Probably. The greatest reason for failure in new lawns is that the seed is allowed to dry out. So you must be sure, absolutely sure, that you water this area twice a day for the next 10 days to two weeks. If you do that twice a day, 10 days to two weeks, depending on the seed varieties that you use, you should get germination somewhere between five and 10 days from now. That new grass seed should be ready to mow somewhere between two and three weeks after it was planted. Be sure you use a very sharp blade. 
Now, while it takes a whole year for that grass to become fully mature, many lawn professionals still prefer seeding to sod because they believe that it produces a much healthier turf in the long run. An alternative to seeding in some cases is to use sod to repair those bare spots. Gives you an immediate effect, and sometimes it's the only way you can get grass on a steep slope. It has just one big disadvantage. It costs about two or three times more than seeding an area well. Now you want to look at your sod very carefully before you buy it. You want to make sure there's no thatch in it. It's got to have a good color green, no yellow or brown spots. It should be moist, but not soaking wet, and definitely not dry. The thickness of the soil will vary according to the type of sod, but usually it'll be about three quarters of an inch to an inch thick. Sod that's too thick roots slowly and sometimes poorly. Sod that's too thin is gonna dry out too fast. Also, sod shouldn't fall apart when it's handled. Keep it covered and moist until you use it, but don't let it sit around too long before you get it out into that lawn. We prepare our bed for sodding in exactly the same way we did for seeding. We wanna make sure there's lots of room for those roots to get down into the soil instead of having to stay within the sod mat. Next, it's very important to thoroughly moisten the soil before we lay down the sod. In fact, it's a good idea to do this maybe a day ahead of time so you're not laying sod in muddy soil. The idea is to lay your sod mats as close and as tight to each other as you can without stretching them. They can take a little manhandling, but you have to be careful. You can tend to tear them if you handle them too much. Then when you have to cut sod, you can either use a knife or a hatchet. We want to thoroughly water the entire area until it's very moist. And then just before we roll it, I like to apply a spray of seaweed extract over the entire site. This helps the roots move into the soil a lot faster than if you didn't do this. Now we want to completely roll the area in at least two different directions. At this point, if there are still some cracks between the mats of sod, you can fill them in with some screen topsoil, and the grass will fill in later. If you want to dress up the outsides, again, use some screen topsoil, but here it's probably a good idea to add a little grass seed. Now we get to the most important step. Just as with seeding, it's terribly important that this sod never has a chance to dry out. We want to water this sod every day for two weeks. And in the beginning, we want to give it as much as an inch of water each day so we make sure that both the mat and the soil gets thoroughly moistened. Remember, the outside of the sod is going to be the first to dry out and the last to join itself to the soil. This sod will be ready to mow when it's between two and three inches tall. And you can walk on it almost immediately, but the longer you wait to use it, the healthier it's going to be. Now for mowing the grass. There are really only two issues, how frequently you mow and at what height do you mow. Studies have shown that frequent light mowings are much better for the grass plant than infrequent heavy cutting. You really should only take no more than one third of a plant at any one time. So if you're mowing your lawn at about two inches, then it's time to mow when the grass hits three inches. 
Depending on the season, assuming you're not overfeeding, overwatering your lawn, that's about every one to two weeks. Many people keep their lawns cut much too short. Small changes in the cutting height can make a big difference in the health and the vigor of your lawn. In just a thousand square feet, if you raise the cutting height just an eighth of an inch, you'll get 300 square feet more leaf surface. Now, since the leaf blade is the food factory for that grass plant, the more leaf surface you have, the more light is absorbed, the more nutrients are produced, the healthier becomes your grass. Now, in most cases, in the spring and the fall, you shouldn't mow your grass any shorter than two inches. Now, I know for a lot of people that seems kind of tall, but there are some very good reasons for that minimum standard. First, taller grass helps shade the soil, which cools the crowns of the grass plants and reduces soil drying, thus reducing watering needs. Second, taller grass will be far more effective suppressing weeds. Mowing northern turf grasses two inches high results in a tenfold reduction in weeds over mowing one inch high. In a recent study, lawns mowed at one half inch contained two to four times as much crabgrass as lawns mowed at two inches. And finally, letting the grass grow up allows the roots to grow down. And that means your lawn will have more staying power during times of drought. In the summer, mow higher, maybe to two and a half to three inches. And that usually means you'll mow less often. Then in the fall, when the grass starts growing again, you can pick up the frequency of mowing, but keep the mower height up there at the summer level. Then for the final fall mowing, you can make the cut down to one and a half to two inches, which will help reduce disease problems developing over the winter. In the shady areas of your property, mow one half to one inch higher than in the sunny spots. This keeps more leaf surface for photosynthesis, making up for that light shortage. If you're cutting your lawn correctly, you should be able to leave your clippings without their making the lawn look unsightly. A lawn will benefit from the cuttings being returned, and you'll save some time from having to continually empty that bag. Don't cut grass that is wet, especially with a rotary-type lawnmower. It causes uneven mowing, the clippings are messy, and they can mat and block light from the grass. It's good to use alternate mowing patterns each time you mow. Mowing in the same direction every time tends to compact the soil and causes wear patterns. Now for a closer look at this machine. Since I've been making such a fuss about changing your cutting heights depending on the mowing season, and you want to have a machine that allows you to change the height of the blade easily and quickly. It's terribly important that this blade stay sharp at all times. You can sharpen it yourself with a file or a grinding wheel if you know how to do that. Or you can completely replace it. It costs something between six and ten dollars and only takes about 15 minutes to replace. As far as I'm concerned, it's easier to replace than to sharpen. If that blade isn't kept sharp, you're gonna start bruising the grass blades and that can cause your lawn to turn brown. Now the normal life expectancy of this engine is 10 years or more, but poor maintenance practices can cause engine failure in much less time than that. And usually the primary cause of engine failure is either a lack of oil or oil that's too thick because it hasn't been changed for four or five years. Now this particular engine is called a two-cycle engine and requires that you put the oil in with the gasoline each time. So that's a step you must never omit. Other kinds of engines have a separate compartment for the oil. It only takes about 15 minutes each spring to completely change your oil. Then sometime in the middle of the season, you wanna check it again to make sure the oil level's proper. Now the second biggest cause of problems in an engine is gonna be grit that gets into that engine because the air filter hasn't been cleaned in four or five years. This filter is nice and clean. If it was all black, that would mean you'd have to clean it with a detergent or a solvent of some kind and then moisten it with a motor oil. This job only takes about 15 minutes, so if you do it every spring, you'll never have any grit problems. Now, any lawnmower repair person is going to tell you that if you change your spark plug every single year, you're going to get the best performance out of that engine. 
So if you spend just one hour every spring changing the oil, cleaning the air filter, replacing the spark plug, or sharpening or replacing the blade, you're gonna get maximum performance out of this engine for many more than 10 years. Watering is probably one of the most overdone of all the lawn chores. People in the north tend to overwater their lawns because they don't want them to turn brown in the summertime. Yet the northern cool weather grasses are the least tolerant to drought and they're automatically gonna go dormant and turn brown when we get a hot summer. It's just natural, it's the way the grass grows. Unless that drought lasts long enough to kill the grass, it's gonna recover just fine when the weather gets cool again. Now, if you insist on having bright green color all summer long, then you must be sure that you water your lawn properly. And watering it every day a little bit is not the proper way. That just wastes water and it actually injures your grass. That approach causes the grass to have a very shallow root system, making it subject to more injury during dry periods and much more vulnerable to disease. The best way to water all season long is to water deeply and to water only when the lawn needs water. Now the easiest way to find out that your lawn does need water is to use a moisture meter that you use on a house plant. All you do is take the probe, stick it in the ground about four or five inches, and if it says dry, then it's time to water. I'll stick it in here and it says wet. So I guess we're finished watering. In order to keep your grass roots growing deeply, you want to moisten the soil to a depth of six to eight inches each time you water. This means applying about an inch of water to your lawn. In dry weather, an average lawn depletes that amount of water in about three days. In the spring and the fall, in about a week. Whether you use an oscillating type sprinkler or an impulse type sprinkler or any other device, you want to make sure you use a tool that will apply the water very uniformly over the area of the lawn. Now how do we know we have an inch of water? Well, the way you do that is you should take one or more coffee cans and you place them around in the pattern of your sprinkler. All you have to do then is figure out how much time it takes that sprinkler to put an inch of water in that can. And that's how long you're going to run your system to put an inch of water in the lawn. The early morning is the best time to water the lawn. In the morning, you're gonna have less wind, you'll have lower temperatures, and you'll probably have better water pressure. The roots are gonna have more time to absorb the water, and there's gonna be less evaporation. Now remember the key points. Water your lawn only when it needs watering, and water it deeply. Fifteen or twenty years ago, homeowners would fertilize their lawns once a year. Some years later, it became twice a year. Now, some sources recommend fertilizing your lawn three, even four times a year. At that rate, the nutrient carrying capacity of your soil is being exceeded. And that overfeeding can lead to a bad environment for many of the important soil microorganisms that you need for a healthy lawn. The end result is a gradual deterioration of both the quality of the soil and the health of your lawn. All in the interest of sincerely trying to feed your lawn enough fertilizer so it looks nice. The truth of the matter is that lawn grasses today need to be fertilized once, maybe twice a year, no more. Warm season grasses should be fed in the early summer. The cool season grasses in the late fall, and then again, if you choose, in the early spring. The fall fertilization will encourage root growth that will help carry that plant through the dry spells the following summer. The spring fertilization promotes grass growth before the annual weeds germinate. Now, if you live in the north and you can fertilize your lawn only once each year, the best time will be in the fall. Now here's an important tip. 
The amount of fertilizer you use can be cut by one third to one half of the recommended application rate if you leave the clippings on the lawn when you mow. They return about 50% of the nitrogen originally applied to the grass. Leaving your clippings is advised for all but the mat forming grasses like creeping bent, Bermuda, and St. Augustine grass where thatch buildup is more of a concern. Another way to reduce your fertilizing needs is to add white clover to your lawn. It's a good nitrogen source for the soil. Now some gardeners will overseed their lawns in the early spring using about a quarter pound of seed to a thousand square feet of lawn. This is going to reduce your fertilizing needs by about one third. No matter which brand of synthetic fertilizer you might buy, be sure that you buy a fertilizer that has the slow release form of nitrogen in it. That will give your lawn a steady source of nutrients through the entire growing season and it won't harm any of the microbiotic life in your soil or scare away any earthworms. A good example of an organic fertilizer is activated sewage sludge. It's called melorganite. It's a good source of nitrogen and it has 4% iron, which is the element that makes your grass get greener. Now another new development in improving the condition of your lawn is a group of products called biocatalysts or growth enhancers. They are made from seaweed or kelp extracts and they don't actually feed the grass, they help the grass to more effectively absorb nutrients from the soil. They improve disease resistance, they help the grass to fix nitrogen, they help the grass to stay greener in the heat of the summer. They're sort of like vitamin pills. These extracts are applied to the lawn as a foliar spray. Using about one tablespoon of extract per gallon of water, the lawn will show results with just three applications. Do it first in March before the grass greens up, then again sometime in July when the weather heats up and the lawn begins to brown, and then again in August to help the grass get ready for the fall. What about lime for your lawn? Lime may be the most beneficial additive you ever put on your lawn, especially if you've been using any fast-acting chemical fertilizers in the past. They tend to make the soil acidic, and most varieties of grass prefer a pH of about 6.5 to 7.0. Now, if you have a soil test for your soil, that will tell you how much lime you have to add to get your pH to the right level. Use ground limestone instead of the fast-acting hydrated lime. Either the powdered or the pelleted versions work very well. Most people don't realize that lime takes up to six months to have any effect, so it's best to apply the lime to your soil in the fall so it's ready to work come spring. Now, if you don't know for sure how much lime to use, an application of about 50 pounds of ground limestone, either calcitic or dolomitic, per thousand square feet will not hurt your lawn and will likely help it considerably. Remember with feeding the lawn, more is not better. Feed it once, maybe twice a year, keep an eye on the pH, maybe give it a vitamin once in a while, and your yard's gonna look terrific. For controlling insects and disease and weeds in my lawn, I use a strategy I call backyard pest management. With BPM, you do everything you possibly can to prevent problems from happening in the first place. Then if a problem does surface, you take only the steps necessary to address that particular problem in a way that's the least harmful to the environment in your yard. Now the first BPM step to take is to use the new disease resistant varieties of grass seed. If you have an old lawn, by overseeding that lawn with those new varieties, you go a long way in making sure that disease has no chance to get started in the first place. Strangely enough, one of the very best pest control techniques is to maintain a healthy lawn using proper lawn care practice. As I mentioned earlier, you prevent disease by watering your lawn early in the day so that it dries out by nightfall. Furthermore, certain turf grass diseases are associated with the availability of nitrogen to the roots of the plant. Brown patch and dollar spot, for example, are caused by too much nitrogen or not enough nitrogen. 
So by simply following good lawn care practices, proper watering, proper feeding, and proper mowing, fewer lawn disease problems are gonna show up. There are two groups of insect pests that can attack your lawn. One group lives above the surface of the soil, the other group lives below the surface of the soil. The group that lives above the surface are leaf-sucking insects, and they include things like chintz bugs, army worms, and sod webworms. To determine if you have any insect problems in your lawn, one trick is to take a coffee can, cut off the top and the bottom, and sink it down into the turf about one to two inches. Then you fill the can with a mixture of either insecticidal soap or pyrethrum about a tablespoon to the gallon of water. When you fill the can like that, insects like chinch bugs or sod webworms are gonna to float to the surface. If only a few bugs turn up, you probably don't have anything to worry about. But if you get more than 10 carcasses, probably should take some action. Insecticidal soap is effective in controlling many of the insect pests that live above the surface of the soil, including aphids, spider mites, fleas, and many others. But because it's a contact insecticide, you must apply it heavy enough so it gets down through the layer of thatch. It's called drenching the soil. Insects that live below the soil surface and feed on the roots include billbug grubs and white grubs. Unusual numbers of birds, like starlings and robins, congregate on a turf grass area often means you have insect grubs in that turf. Also, if you can roll your turf up like a rug, that generally means you have grubs eating the roots of those grass plants. A botanical poison like pyrethrum is often effective against many of the insects that live below the surface of the soil. But the trouble with this and many other strong insecticides is that they only work on direct contact with the insect. And below the surface of the soil, that can be a problem. That's why a very heavy drench is usually required to be effective. I suggest to use these strong insecticides only as a last resort, because they'll tend to kill the beneficial inhabitants in your soil, as well as the bad bugs. Let's talk a bit about weeds. If weeds are a problem, it can be because you have compacted soil, you've been watering improperly, or you've been using either too much or too little fertilizer. Now there are two kinds of weeds to be found in the lawn. There's annual weeds and there's perennial weeds. The annual weeds include crabgrass, knotweed, and chickweed. And the best way to handle annual weeds is to have healthy grass. A thick, tight-knit turf has few weeds and those that are there can be easily hand pulled. With proper fertilization and mowing a little higher, you can either crowd out or shade out almost all the annual weeds. It's the perennial weeds that can be a real nuisance. They include pests like dandelions, Canadian thistle, plantain, and buckhorn. They're pervasive because when you pull them and leave any part or parts of the root system in the ground, you get more weeds. I prefer the spot treatment approach to controlling perennial weeds. There's now on the market a very effective herbicide that uses a substance called glyphosate. It's called Roundup or Cleanup, depending on the distributor. While this is a very powerful plant killer, it's harmless to the rest of the environment, including soil bacteria, earthworms, insects, animals, and humans. It works by getting into the plant's food production system through a foliar spray on the leaves and disrupting the plant's ability to produce protein. A little bit of this sprayed on a dandelion or a plantain, and in two weeks, that's a dead weed. And no return because the roots are also dead. It is very important that you do not use a glyphosate herbicide haphazardly. If by accident you get just a little bit on a flower plant, that flower plant's going to die. But if you use it carefully, you can control a moderate perennial weed problem in any lawn. Finally, if you have a serious weed problem and you use a general purpose herbicide just once, 
and those weeds return within a year, more herbicide is not the solution to that problem. You need to correct the conditions that are allowing those weeds to return. Now, if you use the new varieties of grass seed and you follow the right techniques in maintaining that lawn, there should be no weeds at all. It's as simple as that. And that's backyard pest management. If you use BPM for a few years, I think you'll find that your lawn problems are going to diminish down to almost nothing. In this program, I've tried to show you that it's not difficult to take your lawn, no matter what its condition, and turn it into a healthy green turf that's easy to care for and keeps your home looking attractive all season long. Perhaps the most important point I've tried to make is the more intensively you manage your lawn in terms of feeding, watering, mowing, and weed control, the more likely you're gonna have lawn problems in future years. Now, it's great to have a good-looking, healthy lawn. It's even better to have a good-looking, healthy lawn that's so easy to take care of that you have extra time to read a good book or do something that's more fun than mowing grass.